We're reading this morning from Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 25. This is the account of the heavens when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden there was the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first was the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of the land is good, aromatic, resin, and onyx, is also, onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, there was no suitable helper found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and when he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. This is the word of the Lord. Well, so last week we began our study looking through this book, as Bishop Stanovsky has asked us to do, that we, uh, Brian McLaren's We Make the Road by Walking, the, the purpose of the study is for spiritual formation, that we might grow in our faith through this. It's uh, meant to be a whole year-long study. We'll see if, if it works out really well. And um, Anyway, so last week, we went back to the very beginning. We said, if we're going to grow in our faith and, and grow in our spiritual life, to go back to the beginning and remember that the very beginning of, of faith, I think for most people, is that, that awe and wonder that, of opening up and realizing, wait a minute, there's something more in this world than what I can see, something bigger than myself. And so it was in, we were invited then to look beyond or getting back into that. But, but looking out at creation and being inspired by creation is not enough. There comes to be more. We need to take a further step of faith. Now recall that with the, the book, there are more scriptures probably than what we, we will focus on here in, on a Sunday morning. And so there are, there'll always be like two or three scriptures. And so in addition to Genesis chapter 2, which we're looking at today, um, if you want to write down, it, it's Psalm 8 as well. That's the passage, you know, where it includes that line about, you know, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him. Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, a story of Jesus healing a man in the temple, or healing a man in the synagogue that had a withered hand on the Sabbath and, um, and such. So we might wonder, you know, why do we have two 
passages of, of scripture that speaking about the, the creation. And, you know, it's never really bothered me too much. I've always just thought, well, the first one was, is there more in a broad sense? And the second story tells us a little more details of why God created, or how God created human beings and such. And yeah, last week we were focusing more on, on the, just the beauty of the, the creation story and this gift that we have received of being alive, that all of the earth, all of creation is, is there for, um, to make a habitable place for human beings. I, uh, this whole earth is created for our ability to live and such. And so focusing on the gift and the joy it is to be alive. So the second story we look at, there's an, another passage or story of, of creation. And scholars have discussed, you know, why do we have two here? Or, you know, or did one come from an ancient, ancient mythology or, or whatever? Or, um, you know, is it just a, a clarification of what we have here? And, and McLaren takes the, the view that perhaps this is about, you know, thinking about having more than one perspective, that you get a fuller picture of the whole when you can see from different, from different perspectives. Just like it says we have four Gospels um, that don't all tell exactly the same story. They might tell the same, talk about the same event from, but from different perspectives. Jesus told lots of different parables in order to make his, his point known. And so as we have more perspectives, we get a more full picture of what is happening. And so he suggests, you know, seeing the Bible not just as, as a tidy story with many chapters, but a wild and fascinating library filled with many stories. And so reminding us that, you know, we are a part of the creation. We were made out of the, of the dust, out of the ground, that we are, we are part of the same the elements of the earth. We are earth beings here on the planet, and so we belong, and we are a part of this creation. So in the first story of creation, it gives that broad picture of God creating humanity. There's something in our Sunday school class that we did last summer, um, kind of looking at how does faith and science go together. And one of the, the commentaries that I read there talked about perhaps the first story in Genesis 1 is about, yes, uh, the creation of humanity in general. But then in chapter 2, a particular couple that God chose to put into this place, he calls Eden, um, which is on the earth, a part of the earth, but it's a place we can't go there today. We can try to figure out where it is, but you can't go there because it says so in chapter 3 that, you know, the angel stands guard there with a, his flaming sword. So we can't get there. So it's on the earth, but maybe not of the earth. But anyway, I just think that's fun to think about where God is. But the first creation story, after every little piece that God created, he said, it's good. At the end of each day, he, he pronounced it good. And so now in the second creation story, introduces the concept of not good, the possibility of not good. And so he says, what then, um, the not good, it says that it's not good for the man to be alone. And so God created a second person, a, another person to be suitable for him. And that word suitable in the Hebrew speaks of uh, a thing, something that completes a polarity as the North Pole com is the polar of the, of the South Pole. The two making the opposite and, and such and completing that polarity. He says one without the other is incomplete. And so male and female, he created them. It said to be for, for the purposes of, of companionship, it wasn't good for the man to be alone, and so creating the companionship there. And, you know, this isn't just with the marriage relationship and isn't just male and female. We can have companionship and friendship and love with, with one another in all kinds of different uh, ways. Certainly those who are, are unmarried are still fully bearers of the image of God and complete in themselves. But w companionship is what we are created for, for one another. Um, to be a helper, said that he was, the second person is created to be a helper. So we, we help one another and, and encourage one another and, 
and work together as partners in life. And then, you know, created male and female, you know, primarily for, for reproduction, for the procreation of, of, the, of the species so that we can continue. Because God said, be fruitful and multiply. And so that's not all in McLaren here, but that's okay because that's what it says in the Word. And um, going on, though, he says there's the possibility of not good when now God has introduced choice to the folks. And he's, there are two trees in the garden. He's, one is the tree of life, emphasizing everything that is good that God has given to us. And, and so choosing that aliveness once again, the, the health, the, the um, fullness that we receive there. And what does the other one mean? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Once again, scholars have debated, you know, what can this be? You know, some have, have suggested, are we talking about sexuality that, you know, that they ate? It was like, well, that can't be because God created us to be sexual beings and, and said be fruitful and multiply. And so, you know, that can't be the problem. Um, is it knowing good and evil? Does that mean being, becoming moral beings? Well, certainly when God created us, he created us in his image that we be, were created as moral beings, knowing God's will, knowing um, what is right and wrong. And yes, every person created in God's image. The first story of Genesis makes that clear, that we are all created in God's image, and we bear that image. Um, he says that this would have been, in ancient times, he said that was, it was a surprising message that all people, without exception, are created in God's image. In the old days, they would say, oh, sure, the, maybe the kings and the, the noble people, you know, the, the high ups in society. But no, the Bible says, no, all people, the high and the low, the male, female, whatever, everyone is created in God's image. And so, but we have that choice. We're given that tree of knowledge of good and evil. So what does it mean? So he's making a suggestion here. He says, consider this possibility. The second tree could represent the desire to play God and judge parts of God's creation, all of which God considers good, as evil. So do you see the danger? God's judging is always wise, fair, true, merciful, and restorative. But our judging is frequently ignorant, biased, retaliatory, and devaluing. So when we judge, we inevitably misjudge. If we humans start playing God and judging good and evil, and hear this, how long will it take before we say this person or tribe is good and deserves to live, but that person or tribe is evil and deserves to die or become our slaves? And haven't we seen that in our world? Too much. He says, if we eat from the second tree, we will soon become violent, hateful, and destructive. We will turn our blessing to name and know into a license to kill, to exploit, exploit, and to destroy both the earth and other people. So he reminds us it is a good and a beautiful thing to be an image bearers of God, but it's also a huge responsibility because we can take anything that we have, any part of ourself, and use it either to be creative and generous or to be selfish and destructive. So he says, think of your hand. It can make a fist or it can extend in peace. It can wield a weapon or it can play a violin. Well, not this hand, but anyway. So if the first creation story is about the gift of being human, the second story is about the choice all humans live with day after day. And so as we look at this, I wonder, you know, he's, we often think of that choice of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they were told, don't eat from this one particular tree. You can eat from all the rest, but, but avoid this one. We see that as, as really a, a historic event, a one-time thing that happened, and we're stuck with the results because they blew it. But McLaren's asking us to consider, could it be that, you know, we're all faced with this decision all of the time, every single day, that we have to make choices are we going to choose from the tree of life and, and support and be creative and, and um, do those things that, that encourage growth and 
foster life and well-being within our communities? Or are we going to choose the other way and decide we know better what's, what's right and wrong? We'll, we'll play God and decide and judge who's doing what right and what parts of creation are good and what parts are evil and such. And I think we do face that temptation, all of us, every single day. And it's a challenge for us. There's so much in our world, you know, again, I think, and Paul wrote, he says, nothing in it of itself is, is bad, I'm convinced, you know, but yet we can make choices. I think of, of things, how we've turned things um, that, have, that can be good, that have good purposes. You know, even some things. Now, I am not a, a gun enthusiast, I'll just say. I'm not. But um, I, can, I see it's a tool. And it could be used for providing food for someone's family. It could be used for protection. But all too often it gets used for harm and for evil purposes and killing life. And, and nowadays we're seeing people, you know, wanting to create as much destruction as they possibly can with, with this thing and cause as much harm as they can. I think of nuclear energy. You know, it can be used to warm our homes, and light our lights and such. Or it can be used, formed into bombs and, you know, to create more destruction than we, anything we are even aware of in our life today. But so many things, yeah, I think the, the internet is one of the most important, best inventions of man to date. And, and there's, people want to do so much good and it's like, wow, let's have this. We're going to make communication so much easier and we can all be in better relationship. You know, we'll have social media and, and we can keep in contact with our friends so much better and all this good stuff. But there's always those others that are going to use it. Now we, you know, let's use it for propaganda. You know, and we can use the, the, the internet to, to spread the gospel, spread the message of Jesus Christ. But yes, it gets used for, to spread lies and to spread that which is evil and to, and, um, to bully other people and, and such in, in terrible ways. All these good things, it just aggravates me, you know. It's like, oh boy, let's make life easier for folks and more convenient. You can pay your bills online. Oh, you can shop and buy these products and put your credit card in there. And the hackers are busily saying, yeah, please put your credit card information into this. And it's just aggravating. How we take that which is meant for good which, which could be all of creation. God created this world, meant it for good. And yet by that, he gave us that free will. He chose to give us the choice to live each day. And we make those choices every day. Are we going to live for good, to encourage life and promote what's best for our community, for one another, build each other up? Or are we going to choose destruction and tear each other apart? And the song we sang this morning, you know, bid our sad divisions cease. We have become so divided. And so as we carry this image of God, not as an individual, but in communion, in fellowship with one another, as we reflect the triune God who exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in fellowship, in communion, we more reflect God's um, image than being by ourselves, then can we make that choice every day? How we're going to live? Are we going to live for life? Or are we going to be, choose destruction and death? Moses wrote in Deuteronomy, right when he was making his final speech and before he died and sent the children of Israel into the promised land, he told them how... You know, it, it can be really good. And all these wonderful things will happen if you follow God. But if you don't, it can turn out really bad. And so he called them to make a choice. He said in Deuteronomy chapter 30, he said, This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
And in a similar tone, we remember Joshua, after the children of Israel had gone into the land and had, they're about to settle down and it's come to the end of, of, of Joshua's life. And again, it doesn't matter how you've been, what country you were born in, what parents you had, you cannot be born a Christian. It's a choice. You have to make that choice. And Joshua knew it was the same thing, even though, okay, Yahweh is our God. But yet, each person, each family had to make that choice. And so you remember these, these words of, from Joshua chapter 24. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You know, we have to make these choices. You know, Tom and Cece last 14 years ago made a choice to have T.J. baptized with the hope of bringing him up in the Christian faith, doing the best they could in that. But knowing that one day he has to make that choice for himself. And so rejoicing that this morning he's able to stand here and make that choice. You cannot, parents do their very best to bring their children up in the Lord. But ultimately, every person makes that choice for themselves. Are we going to choose to follow God? Are we going to choose to walk every day? Every day, the Bible says we've got to crucify the flesh. Every day we make decisions because we're tempted to go our own way. And none of us are, are immune to that forces, the, the pull of, of the dark side, if you will. We have to make choices each day to say yes to the Lord, to follow him and choose to walk in God's ways, choosing life. May the Lord help us then to accurately reflect, to reflect to the world, the image of God as we have been created and called to do. So would you pray with me? Dear Father, I thank you that you have created us in your image. Father, help us not to take this for granted or to deal lightly with that. But Lord, to recognize the, the responsibility that we have to live for you, to make right choices. Because other people might judge you even by how we live. And just judge the faith of Christians by how we live. And so help us, Lord, to show the world your love, your mercy, your grace, your righteousness and holiness. Help us each day to choose to walk with you. We lift up our loved ones, Father, who have not quite made that choice and pray that you will help them. May their ears be open and their hearts be ready to receive the seeds of faith. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.